Please open your Bibles with me to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6. Gospel of Mark, chapter 6. We will finish up this chapter this morning and continue on. Hopefully, we'll get through chapter 7 by the time the summer starts, and then we'll take a break from the Gospel of Mark and spend uh, the summer. I'm still thinking about spending the summer in the Psalms. Uh, But be ready for anything. The Lord always has plans that are not always our plans. Amen? Mark chapter 6, and please turn your attention with me to verse 45. Mark 6, and starting in verse 45, hear the words of the Lord. And straightway, he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go to the other side before unto Bethsaida. Well, he sent away the people. And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. And he saw them toiling in rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed them by. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed It had been a spirit and cried out, for they all saw him and were troubled. And immediately he talked with them and saith unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And he went up unto them into the ship. And when the wind ceased, they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure and wondered. For they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. When they had passed over, they came into the land of Gennesaret and drew to the shore. And when they were come out of the ship straightway, they knew him and ran through that whole region round about and began to carry about in beds those that were sick where they heard he was. And whithersoever he entered into villages or cities or country, they laid the sick in the streets and besought him that they might touch, if it were, but the border of his garment." And as many as touched him were made whole. Really, there's two sermons here. There's two separate stories. But I just got to tell you the truth. Mark is the shortest of the four gospel narratives that we have. And Mark is intended to move very quickly. So I am 27 sermons into the gospel of Mark right now. I got to pick it up, all right? So this could be two sermons, but we've condensed it down into one. Considering these things, I was just reminded of several portions of Scripture. I was reminded of when the patriarch Jacob had a divine encounter in a dream, and he saw that ladder come down from heaven where the angels of God were ascending and descending, a picture of Christ, the only way to heaven. And when Jacob awoke from that dream, he said, Surely the Lord was in this place, and I didn't even know it. I was in the presence of God, yet I didn't recognize his presence. Proverbs 25, verse 2 says, It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. Or maybe you're more familiar with the modern phrase here in the West, that God works in mysterious ways. In the passage before us, the apostles of Christ have seen multiple displays of the divinity of Jesus. They've seen miracle after miracle, making it beyond any question the reality that he is God in the flesh. And yet they still were wavering. They still didn't get it. They didn't understand the miracle of the loaves that we learned about last week. And here they are. He's walking on the water before them, and their hearts are still hardened against him. John said that Jesus came to his own, and his own did not receive him the maker of mankind walking amongst humanity. They don't get it. The Messiah of Israel walking amongst his people. Not only do they not receive him, they're about to crucify him. They're about to put him to death, blinded in sin. The opportunity to see God there passes them by. Now, eventually, the apostles would see who it was that they were truly following and calling master, but only after the completion of his earthly ministry. My call to each of us this morning is that we would not be a people who follow around God, 
who are merely close to God, but yet still have hearts that are hardened against him. Minds that are ignorant of who he truly said he was and why he truly came. Let's examine from this passage Christ's withdrawal to secret prayer, his walking on the sea with power, and lastly, his witness for the salvation of the people. Beginning here in verse 45, we see Jesus withdraws. Jesus withdraws. In Mark's signature style, he starts off with, what's the word there? Immediately. The old King James, straightway. Mark's cooking. He's moving through this thing, one passage to another. I mean, if you just sit down and read through the gospel of Mark in one sitting, which you can do fairly quickly, you ought to be exhausted at the end of it. There's no time to breathe. Immediately, he takes his disciples after multiplying the loaves and says, get on a boat. And then he goes to deal with the crowd. What's going on here? Why is he so anxious to get the disciples away from this crowd? Well, I believe John's gospel sort of fills in the blank for us. All of them tell us different aspects of the same stories. In John chapter 6, we read this following the miracle of the fish and the bread. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force and make him king, he departed again into the mountain by himself alone. There's a crowd here, not including the women of children, just 5,000 men. And these are men who want to raise up an army. They just need a leader, and they want to overthrow all of the Roman oppression, right? And they've seen Jesus work this miracle, and they're saying, Jesus is the guy. Let's by force make him our king. And apparently, it's not there in the text, but Jesus probably looked at his apostles and just sort of saw their eyes glaze over, and they were going along with the crowd. <sighs> he is king. Let's, let's make him. Come on. And so Jesus squashes that very quickly right there, okay? I'm going to remove you disciples from that. You get on the boat. You head over back to Bethsaida, and then he deals with this crowd and withdraws from them into the mountain to pray. Now, is Jesus a king, y'all? <laughs> yes, he is. He is the king of kings. And one day he will return. He will set up a physical kingdom. He will put all enemies underneath his feet. But that was not for this time. Jesus was not the king that the Jews wanted in this context. He still had a mission, die for the sins of the world, rise again, and accomplish their redemption. If he were to become a military leader, the, the king of a physical nation state at this moment, he would have not gone to the cross. Our salvation wouldn't have been accomplished. So he withdraws, and let me just ask you, if you had been misunderstood by your closest confidants and forcibly pulled away from a divine mission that God had given you, what would you do? <laughs> you're, you're in the hills now by yourself. I, I think a lot of us would probably vent, find someone that we could just unburden our minds to. I think a lot of us might just want to run away, have a vacation. Not Jesus. Jesus went to find solace in the only place the human soul truly can find solace, the place of private prayer, secret prayer. There's three times in the ministry of Jesus where we're told he withdrew secretly to pray alone. The first was in Mark chapter 1 after his ministry really first began. He cast out a demon in a synagogue. His disciples wanted to pull him away to keep doing more miracles, and, he, and, and so he's praying so as to not get distracted. The second time is right here. Now the nation is rising up. His ministry is picking up speed, right? It, it's kind of at a climax, if you will, of his popularity, his fame. They're trying to pull him away from his mission, so he gets away and he prays. The third time that Jesus will go away to pray by himself will be in a garden called Gethsemane, where not his disciples try to divert him from the ministry, not the nation, but the devil himself will try to pull him away from his ministry. 
And there in the Garden of Gethsemane with sweating drops of blood and cries of agony, Jesus will say, not my will, but thine. Thy will be done. The truth of that old hymn, Sweet Hour of Prayer, was true for Christ, and it's going to be true for each and every one of you, brothers and sisters. In seasons of distress and grief, my soul has often found relief and oft escaped the tempter's snare. By thy return, sweet hour of prayer. How's your prayer life this morning? Are you trying to find relief, inventing your problems to the world? Jesus says, cast all of your cares upon me because I care for you. Are you trying to find relief and try and just work out all of your problems on your own? Why don't you ask God to help you work out those situations? Prayer is the breath of the Christian life. And Leonard Ravenhill used to say all the time, no man is greater than his prayer life. No church is greater than its prayer meeting. Public prayer in the local church, that is fundamental. Family prayer in your home, that is essential. But none of those kind of corporate prayer times mean anything if you and I are not personally men and women of devotional, fervent prayer. Let's have knees that are bruised at First Baptist Church because we seek God so much. I, I was reminded preparing this message of King David in 1 Samuel chapter 30. 1 Samuel chapter 30, you don't have to turn there. I'm not going to read from it. But the nation is so upset with David because the Amalekites came in and just destroyed everything. The people were so burdened and they were looking for someone to blame. So they picked up rocks and they were about to stone King David. And so David withdrew, and it says David did two things. He encouraged himself in the Lord, and he inquired of the Lord. He encouraged himself. Brother, there's times you need to go to the prayer closet, fall down before God, and in prayer, remind yourself of all that God in Christ has done for you. When you despair and you're drowning in shame and guilt or you're overwhelmed with the weight of this life, you say, God, thank you that I am a son and a daughter, that my sins will never be counted against me. Encourage yourself. And also David inquired, God, what do you want me to do right now? And then just stop talking. Wait. Learn to enjoy the silence with God. We're very uncomfortable with silence in this generation. We, we cannot escape these things. We can't escape the screens. We can't escape the noise. You just go to the gas station. They have a screen there that blasts a, a, a commercial at you just while you're pumping gas. Get away from it. We're very privileged in Lake Waccamaw to have nature around us. Why don't you get alone with God and just seek him this week? Jesus withdrew and there found strength to continue his mission. Second, we notice Jesus walked. Jesus walked on the water, starting in verse 48. As he's praying in those hills, a terrible storm broke out across the sea that threatened the lives of the apostles once again. Now, again, his disciples did not understand the miracle of the loaves. His disciples likely were going along with the crowd, trying to make him a king by force. And so, I mean... I'm just going to guess, y'all, while Jesus is praying in those hills, he's probably praying for the Father to give him opportunity for them to get it, for him to show his divinity to them, to show them his true character, his true mission. Job 9, 8, God is described as he who treads upon the waves, he who walks upon the water. As you see this storm breaking out, Jesus goes, thank you, Father, I have an opportunity now. He goes down from the hills and steps upon the shore, takes a step onto those waves, and then keeps walking. There's an interesting phrase here that I want to turn your attention to. Did this confuse you at all whenever you saw here in chapter 6, verse 48 at the end, it says, he would have passed them by. Did you see that? What in the world is going on there? Jesus, you're going to work a supernatural miracle. And it was a miracle, y'all. 
There's lots of commentators out there from very learned, learned people, people who say that they're smart with lots of letters behind their names who will tell you, well, he was really just walking along the sand bank and there was some mist around his feet. He wasn't really walking on the water. Just, the disciples saw him and, and to, from their perspective, it looked like he was walking on the water. Nonsense. This is a display of deity. And if we don't accept that, then we just can't accept that this is God's word or that we believe it. It's inspired. It's inerrant. It's sufficient. And here we have a miracle taking place before us. But you're going to tell me that Jesus is working this supernatural miracle and yet he intended to just pass by the apostles? What's the point? Well, some people think that, again, maybe Jesus only appeared to the apostles to have been walking by him. Others might go so far as to say that this is sort of a mistranslation of the Greek. And the Greek meant to say Jesus wanted this catastrophe to pass by them. I don't think that's what it's getting at here. As all things, we let Scripture interpret Scripture. And with that, I would like to invite you to turn with me to the Old Testament. To the Old Testament, the book of Exodus, the second book of the Bible, Please turn to Exodus chapter 33, and here in the experience of Moses, we'll get a glimpse of what I believe Jesus, God in the flesh, is trying to accomplish with his followers. Uh, As you turn there, a little backstory, the first time the Lord revealed himself to Moses, who received the law, right? How did he reveal himself? It was through a burning bush a bush, and it was burning, but it was not consumed. And, and Moses was commissioned to go and deliver the nation of Israel from the oppression of the Egyptians. And Moses said, who shall I tell them is sending me? And the answer is, I am. Tell them I am sent you. That's the divine name. Only God can claim the divine name of I am. And so now here on Mount Sinai, Moses has an opportunity where he sees God and he says, Lord, show me your glory. I want to see the truest, the fullest extent of who you are, how great you are, the goodness that only God truly has. Show me your glory, Lord. And we pick up in Exodus 33 and verse 19. And he said, this is the Lord speaking, I will make all of my goodness, what? Pass before you. And will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. And and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. If you see me full on, Moses, you're going to die. Verse 21, and the Lord said, behold, there's a place by me. And thou shalt stand Upon a rock, and it shall come to pass while my glory, what? Passeth by. I will put thee in the cleft of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I again pass by. You can't see me full on, or else you'll die, Moses. Let me hide you in the cleft of the rock, and I will pass by. And as I pass by, I proclaim my character. I proclaim my deity. I proclaim my goodness. The same thing happened with the prophet Elijah whenever he was discouraged to the point of death. And the Lord revealed himself through, not, through, through, not through the fire, not through the whirlwind, but through the still, small voice. And it says the Lord passed by as he revealed himself. Jesus is here trying to show himself who he truly is to the disciples, and he's intending to pass by. He's trying to give them a Moses encounter. He's trying to show them his glory and his goodness and the full extent. And sadly, if you want to go back to Mark chapter 6 now, sadly, the disciples didn't get it again. They got scared, and they said, King James says in verse 49, it's a spirit. Greek there is phantasma, which also translates as ghost or phantom. You could even say it's something a little bit more nefarious, like a demonic entity. Something is out on that water that's out to hurt me. What did that put in the heart of Christ? 
I'm trying to show you a those beautiful encounter you can have by letting my glory pass by. And then they say, it's a ghost. Honestly, who knows what we would have done? Probably the same thing. But Jesus still found a chance, found a way to give them that Moses experience. Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. There's no mistake in what Christ is saying right here. The Greek is emi ego. He's saying, take heart. I am is here. Don't be afraid. You hear about those I am statements in the gospel of John. This is an I am statement in the gospel of Mark. They didn't see what he was trying to do by passing by, so he just said it to them. The same way that the Lord said it to Moses at the burning bush, I am is in your midst. In John chapter 8, Jesus said this to the crowd being controlled by the Pharisees. Before Abraham was, I am. And immediately the people took up stones to stone him to death. There was no question in their minds what he was doing or what he was saying. He was saying beyond any shadow of a doubt, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the God who called Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am the God who put David on his throne and gave the law to Moses. I am the only Savior, Creator, and Judge of mankind. I am God. Do not deny the divinity of Jesus. Do not deny it. In the old world, people had no assurance that their gods really cared for them. I read of a story this week where in old Rome, the people would conquer a rival nation, and they would take the the gods of that nation and claim them for themselves. And there's one story where they found a, a, a god that was shaped like a bird, and that god's name was Victory. And the old Romans were so afraid that victory would fly away that they cut the wings off of that God to be sure that victory would always stay with them. I'm thankful that our Lord says, I will never leave you or forsake you. I'm so grateful that even when the disciples were in the midst of the most life-threatening situation, Jesus would not suffer them to perish, but was willing to do the impossible to reach them where they were. The greatest comfort that you and I can have in the midst of our storms is to know that we serve the Lord of the storms, to know that there is no purposeless evil, to know that when we're in the midst of that valley of the shadow of death, you don't have to fear evil because he is with you. David said, if I make my bed in hell, you are there. If you are saved, you're not going to escape God. He will not let you go. And though you might fall, you will never fall away. Your life is held fast in the faithful hands of Christ. Y'all, consider what we deserved. Consider who we are apart from Christ, a hell-deserving sinner. That's what I am. That's what you are without Jesus. And yet Jesus has made himself our shepherd. He leads us through this life. And as the psalmist said, the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything I need. I shall not want. If he is leading me through the storms into eternal life, why would I ever have a reason to fear again? Unbelievers, they should be afraid. Because no matter how bad it can get in this life, it will get eternally worse for them in the next life. But if you are a Christian, no matter how bad the storm you go through gets, that's as bad as it gets for you. You have life, eternal life, abundant life to look forward to. This life is as bad as it gets for the Christian. And when Christ returns or calls me home, I will rejoice with him eternally in heaven. Jesus boarded that ship, and once again, he calmed the raging sea. We're told the apostles were amazed and that they wondered, but don't get too carried away. This was not a positive amazement or wondering. It says in verse 52, they didn't understand the miracle of the loaves, and their hearts were still hardened. What does the miracle of bread have to do with this miracle of the sea? 
Both of them are demonstrations of Christ's true nature to a group of men who were just blind. They were just blind. How could these men be that close to Jesus and then be that ignorant? Right? They've seen him raise a girl from the dead. They've seen him cleanse people with leprosy and deliver those with demons. How could they be that close and not get it? Ready? The same way that you and me can let our Bibles collect dust. The same way that people can claim to be Christians in the Bible Belt and drive by a thousand churches every day and not yet not completely surrender their lives to Jesus. Nothing gives sight to the blind, the ability to hear to the deaf. Nothing replaces the stony hearts of lost men but the sovereign, regenerating grace of our glorious God. And apart from experiencing that new birth, it doesn't matter what you call yourself. Apart from truly being transformed by God's gospel from the inside out, it doesn't matter how long your name's been on the membership role of a local church. It doesn't matter how many committees you've served on or say you've been to seminary, say you've preached from the pulpit, any of that stuff. If you have not personally been saved, been made a new creation by the power of Jesus Christ, you're in the same boat as these disciples. And many will say to Christ at the end of this age, Lord, 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 didn't we prophesy? Didn't we cast out devils? Didn't we do all of these great miracles in your name? And he responds to them, depart from me. I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. You workers of iniquity. It's not about outward nearness to religious things. It's about inward grace sanctifying us by faith. The disciples still needed to decide whose side that they were on. Have you been to the foot of the cross? Have you truly seen the blood flowing down that cross and said, my life belongs to him and I will serve no other? Jesus withdrew for prayer. Jesus walked with power. And lastly here, Jesus witnesses to the people. In verse 53 They land on the other side, and they just keep on going like they did before. Even in the midst of the hardness of those disciples' unbelief, the ministry of Jesus could not be thwarted. I imagine the disciples felt pretty sheepish at this moment. I've felt that way before. I don't know if you have too, but you just go, i got to be the worst Christian in the world. And yet you reach the other side of the shore, and Jesus says, come on, we're going to keep going. Y'all, you can't stay down. You got to keep going. A righteous man falls seven times, but he gets back up again. Peter said, how many times should my brother sin against me and I've forgiven? Seven times? He said, 70 times, seven times. And if he commands us sinful people to forgive that much, how much more infinite mercy is in the heart of our wonderful God? Oh, what a great thing to think about. They land there in the region of Gennesaret, And all of the healthy pick up all the sick and are desperate to get them to Jesus. And Jesus is just continuing like he did before, preaching the gospel, demonstrating his miraculous power. And the people recognized who Jesus was too. I believe that tells us that unlike many of the crowds who just wanted to show, I think these folks were coming to Christ for the right reasons. They were coming to him for the right reasons. And I close with this in verse 56. Mark 6 and verse 56. See if this reminds you of anything. It says at the end of this verse that the people besought him that they might touch, if it were, but the border of his garment, and as many as touched him were made whole. Who does that remind you of? Anybody? It reminds me of the woman with the issue of blood in Mark chapter 5. That woman who said, if I just touch his garment, I will be healed. And by faith, in a moment, she was healed of an ailment she had for 12 years, and she was saved at that very time. We don't know for sure, 
But I find it very likely from this that the testimony of that woman had spread far and wide. And the people of this entire region and the villages and the country all about had heard, did you hear that woman who just touched Jesus' garment and then was made whole? If the grace of Christ was available to help her, maybe that grace will be available for me. And it was. I just got to confess to y'all, I am always slightly annoyed whenever I hear Christians say, my testimony isn't that great. My testimony is nothing really to write home about. Nonsense. If you truly have a salvation testimony, then it is a testimony of salvation, and that is the greatest miracle that can take place this side of eternity. You know what's a greater miracle than walking on water? Getting a new heart. Having your sins forgiven. Being made a son or a daughter of the living God. And some people have a testimony where they say, I lived in the worst sins you could possibly imagine, and I was saved in dramatic fashion, and in a moment, everyone saw it. A lot of you might have a testimony that sounds something like this. I was raised in church, and you know, everyone looked at me and said I was, you know, they couldn't see anything outwardly that made me a bad kid. But then I heard the gospel, and I recognized Though everyone said I was a good kid, I recognize I'm a sinner, that I'm bound for damnation, and that the only way of salvation is in Jesus and faith in him. No matter how your testimony goes, you should know that people need to hear it. When people in Gennesaret heard what the woman did, what happened to that woman, it strengthened their faith to lay hold of the same grace and the same thing will happen with your neighbors whenever you tell them what Jesus did in your life too. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Why don't you tell somebody about Jesus this week? As we close considering these things, let us be a people of prayer. Let us not be a people who harden our hearts in the midst of God's presence and manifold grace. And lastly, let us be a people who are ready to share Christ with others, not being ashamed of what he's done for us. We do this knowing that we serve a God who is with us in the midst of our greatest suffering and storms. We serve a God who treads upon the waters and makes haste to deliver. Let's pray. Lord, Jesus, we thank you for this word that you've given us here. I pray that you would sanctify us today, that these words of Holy Scripture would be planted deep within good soil in our hearts and bear fruit. Lord, I ask that you would keep our church unified in our doctrine and our devotion unto you. I pray that you would keep us unified in our proclamation of the truth in our community around us, that Christ would be exalted in our lives, our families, our church, our town. Take the glory that you alone deserve, Jesus. It's in your mighty name that I pray. Amen.